Hey everybody, we now have um, a different light. So you heard Ed talk about the culture of your organization that could lead to fun, profitability, but it led to the very, very effective team under Ed Scotus' team at CounterHack and the great work they do for SANS, the SANS Institute, where Ed is a fellow. Then you heard Dave Kennedy come talk about, but can you think like your adversaries think about? Can you understand what threat vectors they're gonna exploit, how they're gonna leverage these open source tools, things that are readily available to you? And Ed talked um, you know, about culture. Dave then talked about the technology and these threat vectors. This is not easy stuff. You have to get hands on. You've got to simulate this in the real world. It, they both talked about tabletop exercises and whatnot, but it gets into, you know, how can you get access to real world tools and technologies to take your skills to the next level? But it is about both. It's about using what, what our friends at CyberBit are going to talk about now, real world cyber range that builds the com collaboration of your team, it builds their technical skills, but hopefully it builds their curiosity and the discipline of working together. So my thanks here now to Susan and Wayne from CyberBit are going to talk a little bit about not only the, the tool that they have, and I really hope they, they are, they're gonna do some great hands-on experience for you, but talk about what that means to building your team and your people and their skills. Wayne, Susan, thank you so much for being here. Cheers. Susan is on mute. Let me see if I can unmute her here. Hi, I'm Susan Green. I'm with CyberBit out of Boston. I'm delighted to be here today. I'm responsible for higher education across the US and North America. I've had the good fortune of working for companies like Symantec and Cisco and Dell and, and others. And joining me today is my partner in crime, as I would like to call him, Wayne. If you'd be kind enough to introduce yourself, that would be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I'm Wayne Pruitt. I'm one of the trainers here for CyberBit. Um, I'm kind of a master of nothing and jack of all trades. Um, I've been a network admin, sysadmin, programmer, developer, uh, got into cybersecurity done pen testing, cybersecurity consulting for both uh, DOD and commercial world. Um, and now I focus my time uh, teaching and training um, in cyber and especially on the CyberBit platform. Thanks, Wayne. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk a little bit about the skill shortage. We're gonna talk about um, academic leadership, what the world looks like amongst um, uh, cybersecurity professionals and businesses, enterprises across the U.S. amid the uh, the pandemic, and then we're going to cut into a um, a, a live um, uh, cyberbit range, and and Wayne's going to lead lead you through that exercise. So that's the plan for today, at least for our portion. So the reality today is that there is a huge skill shortage, and organizations are really struggling to find qualified. Uh, practitioners across all different vertical markets. We hear this over and over and over again, whether it's a corporate account, state and local, even at the higher education account uh, level, there is really a struggle for qualified talent. Um, over 63% of cybersecurity leaders say that their organizations are um, understaffed. And what we're seeing quite often is because of the, the lack of skilled um, professionals, we see some businesses subbing out to what we call managed solutions providers or MSSP. So for example, the state of Texas, they had a major breach um, a couple of years back and they actually subbed out to it an MSSP. And if you peel back the onion and you look at that a little more deeply, when they were breached, um, AT&T actually was the managed solutions provider uh, behind the scenes working with the state of, of Texas. But the reality is because there were severe fines, you know, the MSSP is not fined, but the state of Texas was. Um, so we're starting to see more people going to third party companies trying to get talent because the resources are very, very thin. Um, with respect to the numbers across the world, this is a big problem, not only in the US, but across the world. There are roughly around 4 million open positions in the world of cybersecurity today worldwide. Um, in the U.S., we're looking at about 508,000, and it's interesting because quite often I talk to K through 12 uh, high schools, public and private across the U.S., and there's a um, there's actually a lack of of knowledge at the admissions level at some K through 12s where they're at, they're encouraging students to go on and become your your traditional nurse, accountant, or what have you. Um, so I applaud the students here that are are getting into cybersecurity because it's a great, great field that's very, very lucrative. I know entry level positions in the state of Massachusetts, we're talking about $74,000 a year. So it's a very, very lucrative uh, profession. 
And then as you'll see, there is a large gap between demand and supply. Um, cybersecurity is in such high demand and low supply that candidates often have two, three, and four job offers at a time. Um, and it's also uh, pertinent to note that when there's a job opening at, a, at an account, for example, there are many resumes that will come in. So for example, I had been speaking with a major bank recently, they had 275 resumes that came in for one opening. They all look really good on paper, but they have no real way to tell how well does this candidate really understand cybersecurity. Um, theoretically, they look as though they, they have a good grasp of the theor theoretical knowledge, but they don't have, they're not sure of their grasp of the, the practical um, tools that you find in the world of cyber. So we see folks now using our Cyberbit range to actually vet out candidates and validate uh, how well does someone really know uh, what they say they know. Um, and this problem amid COVID-19 continues to be an issue. We saw the open positions growing through the pandemic in terms of open positions. 61% um, of graduates believe that fewer than half of the applicants for open cybersecurity positions are really qualified for the job. This is really important because because organizations are stretched so thin, they want to be sure that they have applicants that have the experience to be successful. So again, talking to talking to that same bank, um, which is a fortune bank, they have made a decision that they are stopping uh, working with new graduates because of this lack of skills. And the response that I got from this one organization was, we don't, we no longer take students because they don't have the practical experience. They come in, they break things because they're not skilled. However, now they're starting to consider looking at institutions that have a cyber range where this is a real world simulator giving students a real experience of um, a live exercise. And that's where, where I think Cyberbit comes in. Um, the uh, lack of skilled staff is definitely a, uh, a, a challenge that continues to uh, be known across all different vertical markets. And major enterprises, corporations, state and local entities are really looking for candidates that have a prior hands-on experience with credentials, hands-on training, critical thinking skills. Critical thinking skills are really important. They want people to be able to think outside the box and look at new and better ways to do things. So it's, it's the whole package. And I know Montreat does a a great job of educating the whole person. And in cyber, cyber just seems to be a, a natural progression for some of the things that Montreat is, is teaching their students. Um, many major um, markets are continuing um, to see this um, gap growing um, and continuing to be a problem. And as I said before, you know, the, the numbers continue to grow amid COVID-19, 508,000. Uh, up from about uh, 500,000 when the pandemic first began. And it can take more than three months to fill an empty cybersecurity position, which is, um, which is interesting. Uh, on average, a company takes 206 days um, to identify a breach and 73 days to contain a breach. So when you sprinkle in how long it takes to get a qualified applicant um, through the process, it's, it's a, a tricky road. Um, and at the end of the day, preparing graduates for their career in cybersecurity is where Cyberbit comes in. And we, we've worked with um, some ma uh, major uh, higher education institutions, being sure that they have a real world platform that helps students to really understand and bridge their theoretical knowledge uh, by using the cyber range. Employers really want, as I mentioned before, experienced practitioners. Um, here's a, um, a sampling of some of the positions that are out there. Um, you know, analyst one, uh, associate security analyst, IS analyst, and you can see that they're looking for different, um, different tenure. So at least six months uh, of cybersecurity operations maintenance, a log monitoring, vulnerability management. Uh, and then there's further definition of cybersecurity professionals with, you know, forensics leads and uh, SOC managers. So there's a lot of different titles that exist within, within the cybersecurity world. 
Um, and attracting new employees by offering training and professional development is something that we're starting to see quite often in corporate, uh, corporate America, where they're trying to find ways to um, encourage employees to stay with companies because there's a lot of churn in the world of cybersecurity. So for example, I was at a conference at the end of December where we had State Street Bank, Fidelity Investments, Akamai Technology, Gorton Seafood, and, and a bunch of others. And there was a communication company that stood up, it was a SOC manager, and he said, you know, I'm not sure if I really want to stay in the world of cybersecurity. I'm struggling to get talent. And you could see how stressed out he was because he's like, I, you know, I, I like my, I like, love what I'm doing, but I just can't hang on to talent. And some days I think I just want to do something different. And then one of those other organizations that I mentioned, they stood up and they said, yeah, we feel exactly the same way. We take someone, we onboard them, we get them skilled up, and then they go across the street and they make $10,000 more a year. So it's a, it's a challenge and, and people are really looking from a business perspective at investing in training and certification, you know, trying to find ways to encourage people to stay um, with, um, with companies that are, um, that have cybersecurity uh, job openings and, and uh, responsibilities. What we've also found is that with regard to training today, um, there are different uh, generations of learners that are out there that are willing to spend time beyond their regular office hours to train. So you'll see that, you know, 82% of Gen X and Gen Y will stay late to train. And that's really important because the cybersecurity profession is really a team-based um, team based profession. And when you conduct some of these exercises as we do, and we work with some of the biggest companies on the planet, we work with NYPD, Citibank, you know, E-Trade, American Airlines, McDonald's Corporation, the list kind of goes on. It's great when you see the different teams training together because that's so, so important. It's not an individualized sport, it's a team-based sport. And then in terms of gaps between industry expectation and uh, academic programs, there is a big gap here, as I mentioned before. You know, academia is really focused on educating the, the student. Um, there's a lot of limited exposure to real world cybersecurity technologies. Um, there's limited exposure to industry verticals, and then there's lack of fam familiarity with real world attack patterns. And that's again, where I think the Cyberbit range really can help you guys to move the needle on learning and retaining the information that's so important when you are uh, conducting an exercise and working on a, a, a cybersecurity SOC team. This slide here really talks about um, the forgetting curve. And, and this forgetting curve is really about the time that you learn something to the time that you no longer can remember it. So you have a learning curve and you have a forgetting curve. What the range does is it bridges the practical, the real world by giving you this continuous learning methodology where you you, you practice, you train, and you test. And you, you do this on different scenarios like ransomware and DDoS. And I know Wayne's gonna walk you through that in a moment. Cyber ranges are really um, evolving. And this slide here really just talks about the way that um, uh, education has been addressing uh, teaching and learning for students. So previously, um, you would find that there were classroom environments that would provide just straight theoretical knowledge. And then you see different or different uh, higher education institutions where they're providing you with bite-sized topics, static information, you know, theoretical knowledge, hands-on building blocks, practical hands-on skills and soft skills. Soft skills are really important within the world of cybersecurity. How well do you team? How well do you communicate? Those are really important when you are thinking about uh, working on a SOC team. And then the cyber range really allows for simulated attacks that are really dynamic, constantly evolving. Um, and there's also a, a key point here where um, when you don't have a range, uh, it can be time, time consuming to train professionals. So on the job training, when you are coming out of a classroom 
uh, environment without a lab or without a cyber range is four to five months of on the job training. Uh, and there are costs associated with that. With the CyberVit range, you are job ready day one. And we've done exercises we, where we have taken a graduate that has been on a cyber bit range and put them against someone that's been on a SOC team. And the graduate has done better in many cases than someone that's been on a SOC team for many, many years. Earlier, I mentioned how we subscribe to this continuous learning um, strategy of learn where you obtain the knowledge, practice where you develop the hands-on skill and really try to learn and retain the information and then apply what you've learned by way of you know, testing and, and going through a simulated exercise. Within the range that um, Wayne's gonna walk you through, you have the ability to learn the lab so you can get some basic fundamental information by going through um, things like Linux and encryption. You can really learn more about the theory. You can learn about different attack uh, tactics and then practicing going through an actual full kill chain from start to finish. Um, you know, everything from spear phishing to delivering the file um, and client hash dump, et cetera, et cetera. It's a full kill chain uh, exercise is one of them that you can go through. And then we, we assess the uh, trainee or the student based on their performance. So there's quizzing and scoring and assessments right within the range. And then within the range, you have learning paths, right? So you can select a particular learning path like a yeah, by role, like a tier one analyst, a SOC manager. And then beneath that, you can go through a series of labs or uh, scenarios that are applicable to that particular role. You can also search by way of topic. So uh, forensics, uh, MITRE collection, uh, Windows forensics, et cetera. And then there are specific learning paths. So for example, you can see here that you have Windows forensics where you could go through a theoretical lab, a practical lab, and then a live fire exercise, uh, aligning again to the MITRE and ATT&CK framework, aligning again to the NICE framework. Or you could go through the OWASP top 10 and you can see the flow there um, of the, the appropriate um, attack. Uh, here is just a couple of examples of some of the work that we've been doing in the world of cyber. So University of Maine at Augusta, they actually have a range where they provide it first and foremost to their students. They have a population of about 330 students that are up in Augusta, Maine, and they use the range to, um, for, the, for the real world experience. And I've gone up there, I've talked to the students, they're like, wow, we thought we knew cyber, now we really know cyber. And they're very confident with, with their approach and they are easily gobbled up up in Augusta and across New England by employers. Uh, the University of Maine at Augusta, they have uh, you know, undergraduate programs, graduate, they just launched a mat master's program as well. They're doing some certificate-based training. Uh, they're also doing some uh, non-credit courses. They also educate some of the K through 12s up in Maine as well. Uh, so a pretty solid program there up at the University of Maine. Uh, also, you have the Miami-Dade, largest public institution in the US. They are training their mostly first generation students in Miami. They're also providing range services to, um, to businesses down in the Southeast. And then you have Purdue University. They are a pretty well-known organization where they are um, offering the range primarily for um, certificate-based programs, training businesses. They do training for like Infosys, Rolls-Royce, Eli Lilly, and a bunch of others. They actually will customize content for businesses so that they can develop a specific program that is very customized to a particular customer. Um, and they're known as uh, CyberTap. They're also doing some work where they've been able to get some dollars from the state of Indiana to train um, not only, um, you know, the training for workforce development, but they're also taking security professionals and taking them through the range because in Indiana, what they're offering is if you're a cybersecurity professional, you can go through a training program and receive up to $5,000 um, to cover the cost of training. And um, they have a great reputation in the world of cyber. Um, we do all kinds of different, um, you know, as I said before, verticals where we're working with different customers that are not only in higher education, but um, other 
um, organizations and businesses like the um, Department of Homeland Security, uh, you know, Geico, and a bunch of others. Um, at the end of the day, you know, being sure that you're aligning with industry requirements is really important from a business perspective. Um, and sometimes certification preparation programs really aren't enough. Um, sometimes uh, having, you know, uh, better uh, real, we know better real world skills actually matter, especially now with COVID-19. We see uh, security operation teams being stretched beyond a point of, um, you would even beyond a point because they're lean to begin with and now they have to deal with the, the remote work from home uh, staff and they're dealing with other uh, challenges just with that. So we also see uh, many higher education institutions going to this online instruction. Most have, you know, as the parent of someone that's in a liberal arts uh, Catholic institution, I know exactly what, what that looks like. Uh, my daughter went to college having, hoping to have a, not just an online experience. And unfortunately for her, she's having an online experience with no face-to-face -face classes. Um, so the world's really changed quite a bit, um, not only in enterprise, but also in academia. Um, and then cybersecurity education post pandemic, we see a lot of financial pressure um, across educational institutions because of the fact that they've had to retool and retweak how they educate students. Uh, there's also a big opportunity to really um, provide a better online experience for students today. I know with the Cyber Range, any institution that's been teaching with the Cyber Range um, has been able to continue to teach and learn amid COVID-19. You can connect into the range remotely. We can do, you know, team-based training, individual training, you know, capture the flag training, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just a little bit of context about what's happening in the world of cyber, some of the things that CyberBit's been doing, the huge opportunity that you guys have to go off and make your mark in the world of cybersecurity uh, in a profession that is, um, you know, very lucrative and very, very much in demand. So that is just a little bit of context. I'm now going to turn it over to, um, to Wayne to actually get right into the range. Any questions? I don't see any yet, Susan, thank you. Okay. All right. So what I'm gonna do is jump right into the range and show you guys the platform and how we, we use it to train SOC teams and go through and uh, put them through one of our end-to-end -end attacks in our, our scenarios. So let me get my screens all set up here. Um, so first off, when you first come into the range, we tell you about a little bit about the exercise, but we don't tell you what the attack is. Because for example, you know, an attacker is not gonna call you and say, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send you a Trojan in an email in about 10 minutes. Um, go ahead and click on that for me. Or they're not going to tell you, you know, they're going to say, hey, I'm going to hit you with ransomware. They're just going to attack you. So in our about to exercise, we're, be, we're telling you you're a member of a SOC team. You're going to monitor this network and you're going to look for suspicious activity because that's what SOC analysts do. And uh, we give you a share drive location that has um, additional forensics tools that you might see in any organization. You know, Sys internal suite with Process Explorer, Process Monitor, Wireshark, you know, tools like that, um, maybe a Base64 decoder or a uh, disassembler if you're going to get into reverse engineering of malware. So we give you that as well. So once I have an idea that I'm just going to be monitoring this, this uh, network for some sort of attack, I move on to my network info. What we give you is a network map of the network you're going to be monitoring because if you're working in a SOC team, um, you're going to have some sort of network map. It's probably in reality out of date, but um, you're going to have some sort of network map. And so in our case, we give that to you. Um, we simulate the internet because our system is air gapped um, because we do run live malware, but we simulate the internet and we you will see web traffic, you'll see internet mail traffic, DNS traffic, you'll see all of that flowing in the network. Um, we have a DMZ segment with a multitude of web servers, IIS, Apache, we even have a WordPress, a mail relay. 
Then we have an internal web segment with a couple of web servers and a pro FTP. Then we have our internal server segment, which has Active Directory, mail server, uh, network management system. We have McAfee and uh, ePolicy Orchestrator, which is McAfee's enterprise endpoint protection. We have a SIM segment. Um, our networks, we use um, actual enterprise license tools. So in my case, I picked the network that has Splunk uh, with enterprise security. We also offer like QRadar or ArcSight, you know, tools that you're actually going to use in a, in a SOC team. Then we have our user segment with a variety of workstations, database segment, and you can see I have two Palo Alto firewalls. So we've tried to make it as realistic as possible. We've tried to replicate a normal small to mid uh, mid-sized organization in the types of technologies that you're going to see. In our network, if you go to a website or a web server, there is a website running. If you make comments on the forum page, they will update in the database. You see users logging into Active Directory. You see authentication happening. All this traffic is going on in the network while you're monitoring it. So we give you your network map. <clears throat> we give you uh, all the network information. Because again, you're working in a SOC. You probably have a network map. And you have some kind of access list, right? That shows you how to log into all your systems. So we provide that to you as well. You have all the host names, usernames, passwords, everything you need to log into anything in this system. So you have full access to the firewall, the workstation, the servers. If you need to log into Active Directory, change a group policy, disable a user, you can do that. If you need to add a firewall rule, change a firewall rule, you can do that. You know, the same tasks that, that a SOC analyst is going to perform inside an organization. So I have all my information. I'm going to move on to what we call our mission phase. This is where I'm going to actually investigate the attack. I'm going to monitor the network. I'm going to look for suspicious activity, and then I'm going to investigate. So I'm logged in to... Um, we click on this open simulated station it brings me into a Windows 10 workstation. Now, a lot of labs and stuff, a lot of some ranges as they call them are basically gamification platforms. It's some kind of game, you're gonna compete, you're gonna have some fun. In ours, we wanna make it real. We want it to be just like you're sitting in a sock. So I have a Windows 10 workstation. I have Sys internals, I have base 64 decoder, you know, Chrome, Putty all tools that you're gonna see in a normal SOC. I have my network info and I have my network map. I have nothing, no game, no, nothing like that. I'm sitting on an actual workstation that's connected into this network. So what I would do is open up my security tools, my Palo Alto firewalls, my SIM, open up my network management system, my McAfee ePolicy orchestrator, and I've already opened all these tools up to get ready. So I have, you can see these are actual tools, right? I'm actually in a firewall. I'm seeing the traffic. Um, I have both of them up. I have my DMZ firewall and my internal. I can look at the policies. I can create policies. I can change policies, whatever I need to do. I also have Splunk, which is my SIM. I see I have a couple of alerts that have already triggered. I'll come back to those in a second. Um, we are running Splunk with enterprise security. Um, so I, that's the view I prefer is under enterprise security. If I can see, I still have the two alerts. I have my McAfee ePolicy orchestrator, which likes to time out on me. Um, so I have McAfee, I have my dashboard. I can uh, look into these kind of alerts and I have my network management system, which Xenos, what it tells me is our systems up, are they down? Um, do, um, you know, is the web service running on the web server? Is the SQL service running on the SQL server? That kind of stuff, hard drive space filling up. So it kind of gives me information about a system. So 
from a SOC analyst point of view, you know, I'm monitoring, I'm looking at it. I've got a couple of alerts. I need to start investigating, kind of figure out what's going on. So I'm going to look at this under incident review. So I see I've got port scanning. So let me look into that a little bit. And I've got something is port scanning this 130.2.1.21 address. That's the destination. And so I need to figure out, you know, where is it coming from? Why is it doing this? Um, I can do that in multiple ways. I can do it in the SIM. I can do it in the firewall. Um, me personally, I'm more of a firewall person because I used to be a network admin. So I'm going to go into the firewall and I'm going to look up that source destination and figure out if I can see where what's going on. So I'm going to look at that. And 30.2.1.21, I believe is what it was. Yep, 2.1.21. I'm going to add that. So I'm going to filter my firewall down and see what's going on. And I'd look through here um, and see what is trying to hit this address. And when I do that, I see here's the port scan going on, all the ports being scanned. I see it's coming from this 199.203.100.70 address, which um, is actually an actual address out of Israel. Then I come up and now I see that it's scanned port 22. And then now I'm seeing a lot of 22 connections, which is probably not good, right? Um, so, now I've got a little information about this. I'm going to go look at the other alert to see if it's it has anything to do with the port scanning. And I see this same IP address is done a brute force attack against 172.16.100.21. So I would go and investigate that and look into this as well. Um, but I already know that this is making an SSH connection here. This 130.2.1.21 for the, the sake of time is our external IP address of this 172.16. This is the internal address. So we've got a port scan happened. The attacker found 22 was open, started doing a brute force attack and now we have this alert as well saying failed password for invalid user um, on this uh, from this IP address. Now to show you that I can do more research in um, Splunk itself, I can go up, do a search. Maybe I wanna look for this IP address and see what's going on with it. So I'm gonna look, I'm just gonna do a general search and I'm going to pull, it's pulling, I've got over, you know, 300, almost 340 events um, pulling from different sources. I'm going to look at the source type. I can see I've got Palo Alto traffic and I've got some syslog traffic. Well, the Palo Alto traffic, I've already looked in the firewall. I'm pretty sure I know what that that is. Um, and so I'm just going to filter down to the syslog traffic. And now I can see it's coming from this 172.16.100.21. And so I could start researching, going through the logs, trying to determine what, what happened. But I can see I've got failed password for root, invalid user admin, failed password for uh, user admin. It goes on and on. And then I have this one right here. I have an accepted password for root. And so now I know this attacker has gained access to one of my systems. So while I'm doing this, what I wanna do is track what I'm finding. So, and these, these scenarios like this can be, I'm doing it individually, but this can be done as a team. It's how these scenarios are done. That way you could have one person in the firewall, you might have one person in the SIM, Maybe one person needs to log into the server and figure out what's going on. And they will be working together as a team, talking to each other, saying, hey, I'm seeing this in the firewall. I'm seeing this in the SIM. And they start correlating data. But as they find stuff, they'll come back to our platform 
and they're going to put in the things they find. So they're going to start tracking what's going on. So we're going to say, well, I found a port scan. You know, what was this destination IP? So I'm going to answer that. That one was pretty easy. Um, I found that one. And uh, I'm currently running in what we call training mode. So it allowed me to check to see if I'm right or wrong. And it'll give me that feedback. So Wayne, this, this is a way for, yeah. for essentially the teacher, the instructor to help assess and grade their progress performance. Yeah, absolutely. So in this case, I'm in training mode. So it will give them feedback. It'll give them, you know, if I was wrong, it'll tell me it's wrong. Um, and then the other option is we can run in what we call uh, test mode or an assessment mode. And then whatever answer they put in, that's the answer that it takes. And then the score is done at the end. Um, so we have both options. Um, in this case, you know, it's going to give me some feedback. I click on it and you can see I got 12 points. So if I'm going through, I'll show you what it looks like if I do it wrong. Um, password brute forcing. What was the target? We know it was that 172, 16, 100.21. And was it successful? Maybe I, I didn't find that log and I said, no, it wasn't. And so I check it and it, it tells me I'm wrong. So I go back, make sure, verify it. I find that log showing there was successful log on. And so I check it and I'm correct. In the assessment mode, it would have taken my first answers and then I wouldn't have got points for this finding okay. um, at the end. Thanks. So we give you, you know, a little different options. So I'm going through and, you know, I've, I've found these and I know I have a successful log on. What do I do now? What am I supposed to do? Maybe I'm not sure um, what to do. And so I can come back and like I said, we're in training mode. So it's going to allow for hints and uh, I can get a hint. So maybe I click on this. It says, well, if I take a hint, it's going to reduce my score uh, for this finding 50%. So it'll reduce it from 12 to six, but I'll say, okay, cause I'm stuck. I don't know what I'm doing. And it's going to say, did you check the NMS system for any critical alerts? The NMS is my, uh, network management system. Well, I didn't check that. So, okay. But it doesn't give me the answer. It just gives me a direction to go. So I'm going to go look in here. I see I've got a um, critical alert. So I'm going to go look at that. And I find that I have the HTTP service is down. Um, so this service is not running on the system. So it's triggering an alert. And so I say, okay, I come in here and I'm like, well, I have a service that's shut down. What's the name of the service? Well, this is an Apache server and HTTP on Apache is an Apache is the Apache 2 service. Does it continually shut down? I have no idea. I haven't investigated that yet. What is triggering the action? I have no idea. So I need to go investigate that. So I'm going to save this as a draft. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to investigate. So the easiest way to do that, um, I mean, you can look through the sim logs if, if that's what you do. I'm a Linux guy. So I'm going to remote right into the box and research it. Um, so I'm looking for the Apache server. If I can type, it helps. And so I'm going to log right into the server and um, investigate. And how did you know what the credentials were? Is it? So right here in our network info, remember I said we give you okay. all the logon credentials that you need to log into anything in the network. Um, they're right here. Here's the username and the password. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, because we want you to be able to, we want you to be able to investigate however your team is comfortable investigating. Like I said, I've seen teams that do 90% of it without leaving the sim. I've seen other teams that they get the alert in the sim and they dive right into the servers and start looking, right? Um, it just depends on how the team operates and what they're comfortable with. And some people are, are 
better at just logging into a server and going through it and some are better at querying the sum so we try to make the platform as flexible as possible right so i'm inside the server and uh, i want to i want to figure out if my apache service um, will stay running if i start it so i'm just going to start it up because i know it's down so i'm going to start it I'm going to do a status. Helps if I type right. And so I see it's running. I'm going to keep checking it because the question it asked me was, will it stay running? And now I see that it's shut down again. So I can go back and answer that question. Say, yes, it continually shuts down. Well, what's triggering it? I still don't know that. So I'm going to have to go back, continue to investigate. Now, uh, for sake of time, I will show you that it is a cron tab. Um, cron is like a scheduled task for Linux. It continually uh, runs on whatever schedule. And so I go look at that and I see that every minute um, Apache is being shut down. So I can go and answer that question and say it's being triggered by a cron job. And I'll check that and submit. And while that's loading, I'll come back here. The other interesting thing I come across is this script right here. I might want to investigate that, figure out, well, why, why is this here? So if I go and look at it, And we open it up and what I can see here is this script makes a directory and then it copies the Etsy password and the Etsy shadow file, which the passwd file contains all our user names and the shadow file contains all our passwords. It's copying them to that directory. And then there's this Python script that's uploading those files to um, the same 199.203.100.70 address. So we have some data exfiltration going on here that, um, you know, we need to stop and, and report on that as well. Wayne, some of these events where they're cascading because the, the longer it takes for you to find it, the more damage is done and therefore it gets harder and it starts to spin out of control. Yeah, absolutely. Um, depending on the scenario that's running, um, it can, it, the attack chain continues to get, um, to continue to do more and more things. So the quicker you find it, um, you know, you might be able to stop some of the damage that's going on. So I'm going to come here and say, I found a file. It was under, um, slash temp. Oh, yep. Slash temp BD bash dot sh. It's a bash script. And what is the purpose is to um, exfiltrate usernames and passwords. So I'm going to check that. And then the other thing I found was that Python script, which I can never remember the whole name. This is the exfiltration, exfiltration script, right? Yes. So I'm just doing this so I can see both of them at the same time. Um, full path slash temp slash B64 PHP uploader dot PY. And it asked me which file was used to execute this. And so we know that was the BD underscore bash script that actually was executing this uploader. So I'll submit that. That kind of malicious activity has Susan Green written all over it, doesn't it? Wayne? Yeah, it does. It does. She's she got to watch her. She's sneaky. Um, and so now, um, 
I have gone through and kind of found all the steps that the attacker has taken. We know he did a port scan. He did a brute force attack, gained access, shut down the Apache service, created these cron jobs, and then was exfiltrating our um, usernames and passwords out. So what I want to do is I want to actually respond to this attack. And you can see that um, there's nothing to show me what I need to do, right? I need to respond based on what I found. So I'm going to go into the network and I'm going to try to fix what this attacker has done. So some of the things I will do, I'm probably going to get rid of the cron tab. So I'm going to remove Wayne, that. Does it, does it take yep. screenshots periodically of people's behavior or record it in such a way that the instructor can go back in time and see what they were doing? So, so we have two different platforms. Um, we have our cloud version, which is what I'm using here. And then we have what we call a dedicated instance or an on-prem system. With the cloud platform, we don't, um, we don't record the sessions. With our dedicated instance or on-prem platform where an organization would would buy an instance for themselves, it will record the entire session. It'll record what each trainee is doing. And then the instructor can go back, replay it, show them what they were doing. You can talk about, you know, it, at this point, you know, you did this, here might've been a better way, or you can go back, maybe somebody did something that you've never seen before and it worked. You can say, hey, explain to us why you did it. Um, you, you really blew me away with this. And, uh, so you can kind of, um, work it that way, either way, but yeah, the cloud platform cool. being a shared instance, um, and resource utilization, we don't record all this. We don't record the sessions. The, the other thing on the on-premise side is within the platform, you have, um, chatting and collaboration tools on the on-prem so that the team can communicate okay. amongst themselves and with the trainer. <clears throat> Absolutely. So I've, I've deleted the cron tab. I'm going to go, um, I'm going to CD to the temp directory and I'm going to look around and say, okay, I want to remove the, um, BD directory. I want to remove the base 64 Python script. I want to remove the BD bash. So I'm going to remove those files. I will go back. So while you're cleaning up the exfiltration damage, right. you yes. start to maybe address the root cause. Correct. Yeah. And so I'm going to check my actions. I did a couple of things. So I'm going to, we have sensors that will go out into the network to see if I've accomplished certain tasks. And so uh, it'll take it a second to run here. Um, but what it's going to do is come back and, and tell me if, if the actions I've done, if I get points for those, or if there's still more actions I need to complete. So you can see I've deleted the cron job. So I got some points there. Uh, cool. Um, it's still checking, but um, now it shows I, I got rid of the Apache cron job. Um, and there'll be it, it'll come back with one more. Uh, the Python script's gone, and then the BD bash script is gone. But it, I still need to do some more cleanup um, and get this thing up and working. So I'm going to go back in. Say I'm like, I don't, I don't know what I need to do. So I'm going to click on hint. And it's going to say restart all the services that got shut off. Okay. So I'll go back in. And I'm going to restart um, Apache. So I'm going to restart that service. <coughs> Excuse me. And then, um, you know, other other steps that I might take, um, I might put in a firewall rule. So let me. Um, Go in here and do policies. Um, so maybe I'm going to go add a firewall rule to block um, attacker and say I want to block um, outbound. Or now we'll say inbound. 199, 203, 100. 
70. Destination, any, any. I'm going to say I, I want to block it from that attacker to any address inside my network. And I'm going to deny it. So I'm going to say OK. And then um, with Palo Alto, it always puts it at the bottom. I want to move it up to the top because firewalls work in order. And if there's a rule above mine that allows the traffic, it'll never hit my rule to stop it. So I'm going to go ahead and, and do that. Where is... Commit. So I'm going to commit my changes. And then I'm going to go back and check actions and see if I've done everything I need to do to um, stop this attack. So at any point during the scenario, if I'm to the point where I am um, stuck completely and I just have no idea what to do, I can always open a full solution brief and it's going to give me basically the answers to the entire scenario. It's going to show me the port scanning, the brute force, going to give me some information about it. And, uh, you know, I can go in and learn about, you know, why, um, why this is an issue, you know, what, what happens when you're exfiltrating those files. And so you can uh, go through and see exactly what's going on. Um, and then I'm just going to go ahead and complete the mission. Say I'm done. I've blocked everything. It's going to then bring me to a quiz where I can answer a few questions about the scenario. Ask me how to prevent maybe this in the future. Like what can be done to prevent this? Well, I would block SSH from the internet. There's no reason for that. Um, best practice regarding password changes, you know, every six months, make them complex, not easily guessable. And who knows the root password and what can be done about it? Well, it's been compromised by the attacker and we should change it. And so I would submit. And then it's going to come back and give me what I got right and wrong. And then it's going to give me a briefing, a summary of uh, my scenario, how the team did, what their score is, what they completed, what they didn't complete, um, how they did on the quiz. It tells me I used two hints and that I opened the solution brief. So depending on you know, the instructor, how you, you know, if they open the solution brief at, you know, three minutes in, then you might want to adjust this score down to nothing. Um, but if they open the solution brief towards the end, you know, then you have the option to adjust the score however needed. Um, so that's kind of the, the platform, uh, a quick walkthrough of, of a scenario and how you would use a platform to investigate. Any, any questions? And Wayne, so professors, instructors, right? They're writing up, they're writing up their own scenario, leveraging the ones that you have, but they're writing up their, their others as well, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with the, with the dedicated instance, you have the ability to customize the network uh, with our pro tools. You can create your own scenarios, your own attacks. You can create your own networks. You can add different tool sets. Um, there's a lot of customization available with that. With our cloud platform, um, we have out-of-the-box networks, out-of-the-box scenarios. A lot of organizations start with those, and they, they use those at first, and then move into customization later. It, it all depends on, on what your goals and, uh, are and how you want to use the platform. So the customization is for the on-prem version? Correct. All right. When you think about training instructors, uh, professors for those, the on-prem customizations, what does that look like? Is it a couple of days worth of training for them to really understand how to create the scenarios, think through the attack vectors, score it? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, so when, when we bring customers on board, I do a couple of different options for train the trainer. Um, one option is I show them, we go through about a half a day, and I show them how to run a training from the trainer side. And you can see everything the trainees are doing. You can see um, what they're working on. You can take control of their screen. 
So we kind of do an overview of that. Um, and then we can go even more in depth and we can spend, um, we spend a couple of days going through how to build scenarios. Um, and then what I do is go into, we actually do walkthroughs of each scenario. So the instructor is very familiar with the, the platform, the scenario, how it works, how the attack is going on. So it, it just depends on the instructor and how much in-depth um, training they want or need. And, and we customize everything mm -hmm. to, to a higher education institution's requirements. Uh, we don't see things often being exactly the same. Yeah. And think about it from a student's perspective, right? They're looking for hands-on experience, but I'm guessing you guys have been at this for a while and with leaders in the space and the leader in the space. What are some of the unintended benefits that students and professors are getting out of this that they might not have thought about? So what I've seen, I've, I've worked with a couple of universities putting, putting some students through an exercise and, you know, they're the, some of the comments I get is, you know, they've had the network classes, they've had the network theory, they know how to, they build a network. But to actually log into a firewall and build a rule and stop that attacker is like that next step. You know, they've, they've done the firewall rules and all that, but to actually see it block that attacker uh, really brings it into perspective. That's one of the one thoughts that I had is that I see students who understand networking. Mm -hmm. I see those who understand web. I see those that understand maybe some of the threats. And then you sit there and you go, but you know what they don't understand? They don't understand how a data bit and a byte follows that entire logical framework mm -hmm. through the architecture, from the bad guys, through the network, all the way into the computer, into CPU, BIOS or whatnot, and back again. And then when they see this happening and somebody can describe it to them, the theories that they were learning individually now starts to, to paint a picture as opposed to individual dots. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When you when you put a scenario, this, was, this scenario here is, is a simple one with one server being attacked. Um, we have other scenarios. We have one where it's a cross-site scripting attack on the web server, um, which gives um, access to a workstation. Then from there, they laterally move to a domain controller. They gain access to a database. And so now you might be familiar with web, but now you have to deal with the database, the domain controller, a workstation, all during the same attack. And so it really brings all of that together into one, one incident that you have to figure out how to deal with. And I assume the overflow as well, where somebody didn't have the, uh, the UI configured correctly and now somebody's able to stuff it into the yep. database and yep. overflow and it's got it. The uh -huh. You can simulate that threat vector as well, I assume. Yes, yes. Very cool. And then the, the summaries that were written up, how, ma how many different scenarios do you have in your, your web version? Um, Right now we have over 40 different end-to-end -end attacks and then we've added numerous labs and we're adding new labs every week. Um, the labs are more individual based. So you would get on a, a very similar to what I did today. You get on a network, you have one machine and you're maybe you're learning how to do um, examine processes to look for a malicious process. Maybe do another lab to learn how to reverse engineer some malware and the malware is on the machine, the tools are there and you go through that process of reverse engineering it. And I think you were on earlier where you were listening to Dave Kennedy talk about just the standard stuff you should be doing, but also where we're going. And one of them is like, make sure your systems are patched, make sure you've configured your systems correctly. How, how do you assess those? How do you help students understand those? Maybe we call the basics of those. Patching. Yeah. With our, with our labs, let me, let me bring up another screen. Um, and I can show you. So what we have is um, all our scenarios are marketplace, but we offer these learning paths and that Susan had mentioned in her slides. Um, so for example, if we want to get into looking at Windows forensics, for example, these would be the labs, you know, learning pro how to examine processes, how to do macro file investigations, shadow copies. And then you work through these labs, which prepare you for these larger it, scenarios or these larger exercises where you have to deal with a Trojan attack or a worm attack. Um, and so we are, we are building out learning paths. We're adding new labs every week. And so um, that's where we would start developing those basics. And we work with the universities. If, if you come back and say, 
we really want a lab that deals with this, we would we would work on developing that lab and adding it into the platform. Like a lab you've properly configured and hardened to Active Directory yes. in your O365 yes. environment. So, okay. Yep. Well, very cool. I know we're at the top of the hour. Um, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate the insight and the education. This, uh, the college knows this is something we're, we're considering to expand our program and hope to make this investment in 2021. Uh, so thank you so much for giving us all an education and understanding the power of the platform. Yeah. Thank you Excellent. very much. Thank you so much. We really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Stay safe. And thanks, thanks again on thank behalf you. of myself. Everybody have a great day.